Okay, we're uh, at the Science to Business Marketing uh, Conference in uh, Winter Tour, Switzerland. And we have the great pleasure of speaking with Andy Pollain, who was um, one of our guest speakers, uh, guest speakers, actually, um, main speakers. Um, he is a service and experience design consultant, writer, and educator, which suggests quite a, a differentiated background. Uh, just in terms of your own experience, um, and obviously we'll come to the design component that you talked about, but I mean, you've, you've got quite an integrated or cross disciplinary disciplinary background. Yeah, it's, it's either jack of all trades and master of none or a cross disciplinary background. The second one sounds better, harder to say. Um, I studied film and uh, photography and video and, and just in that, uh, in the early 90s, beginning of the 90s, and just in that um, year was the beginnings of what was then called multimedia authoring, which is now interaction design. And so that was a sort of switch for me. Then I carried on studying film and I'm very interested in, the, in that whole process and, and creative process and production model. But um, the whole interactive world was really interesting and new back then and I did a lot of work then looking at um, trying to understand how interactivity works and what makes people engage and a lot of stuff was about playfulness actually and I've, I've seen a lot of that stuff come back around again in the whole gamification movement. And then I went to Australia for seven years and I was teaching interaction design there and, and, um, and, and working there and whilst I was there we, our, in, our, our university had um, a restructure or the faculty was talking about restructuring and I noticed that we were mostly designers or designers and artists uh, working on this process and we would sit with sheets of A4 paper around the table and, and sort of read them out and I thought why aren't we treating this as a design process and, and sort of working with this drawing stuff out and working with stuff on the wall and finding out what people's needs are and so forth. And then when I went back to England um, to just to visit family and friends, and I went to see a friend of mine, Ben Reason, who is one of the directors and founders of uh, Live Work, one of the co-authors of the book. And this was early 2000s, and he said, well, we're doing this thing called service design. And he, as he started talking about it, there was a real sort of light bulb for me of, aha, this, this way of thinking has a name. Now, so for me, um, service design has a, 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 an aspect of that sort of networked way of thinking that uh, digital and interaction designers have, that we know we're not designing just a website, but actually it's sort of something that's part of a larger system, plus then the actual kind of physical elements and organizational elements. And so that's then what I started um, gravitating towards. And now I, I consult here, but also work in, in, um, in Luzerne, in Switzerland, uh, teaching service design at the Hochschule Luzerne. Um, and for me then writing, I've, I used to be, well I still do write, but I was, for a while I was a design journalist for an Australian design magazine actually. And that discipline of turning out a thousand words every month um, was really, really useful. And I, th I think I've learned more about design through writing than I have through designing actually. Do you think as a, if you're going to be involved in innovation, do you, do you, is it essential to have this cross-disciplinary background or the, this ability to be flexible? Is that one of the key attributes of, of, of the people involved in innovation? So I think for innovation you need a, a mixture of the two because it, some people find it really hard to have ideas and some people find it hard to implement them or, and some people find it hard to have ideas that are um, going to converge at some point in the future that's going to be useful. And so I think uh, uh, from my side of things a uh, very useful, I, I read very widely, I sort of try and take a lot of different inputs and uh, I have a kind of mind that uh, connects a lot of different things and, and sees patterns there and thinks oh there's an interesting thing or there's this thing and this thing and if they were together that would be interesting. But you really also need people who can implement the stuff because it's, it's, it's not easy necessarily to come up with ideas but in some ways it's easier to come up with an idea than it is to actually do it. Um, that's the bit I've learned from writing actually that there's you just have to sit and type at some point right you can have an idea for a book and, and so forth for ages but actually you have to actually just get down and, and write it and through that writing you then restructure it and rethink it so it's, a, it's an iterative process too so I think you know a mixture of the two is important sounds very much like an academic process actually <laughs> Hey, you gave some uh, really great tips uh, tips in terms of how you might go about innovation and I think uh, the audience was fascinated with some of the, the things you were saying such as you know if you if you don't design it someone else will and um, if you don't provide communication channels someone else will um, there's some real uh, useful practical things that people can implement 
I had a really interest. Uh, I had a really interest that though. Where would we start if we're talking about innovation? What do you think is the starting point? I think the starting point is always what are people doing and what does it look like they need, or what do they, you know, what does it look like? Then what are you observing and understanding uh, that they need? Not just ask them what they think they want, because then you get that thing of um, people say something that they think they want because they they don't know anything else. Um, so for really understanding how people's lives is, is, is central to any kind of innovation. Um, and, you know, and that's in a particular area, I guess I'm talking about service design or things where, that people use on a, on a sort of customer or daily basis. And a customer could be a B2B thing too. Um, you know, and obviously there's, there's technical innovation too, but what I see quite often is a lot of technical innovations happen and uh, design, uh, so engineers, and sometimes industrial designers, but usually engineers um, discover something and they do something because the technology can do it and then they're looking around for the problem to solve. And, and for me, it should be the other way, the other way around. Um, and it's a bit of a leapfrog. It's a bit of, it's a bit of both. I don't think it's one or the other, but, the, but it, when it's combined, it's really powerful. And how would you then involve, you talked about starting at, uh, at, at the point which is people, observing people, seeing how they're doing things and what they might need. How do you then involve people in the process of innovation? How do you get them, I mean, do you involve them? Um, it depends on, on who you're dealing with and what you're dealing with. So there are things where um, you can involve customers and frontline staff because often they're the experts, right? So and later we're going to talk about the academic setting. Students are a really good example. So students experience the, the institution in a 360 degree way. They experience IT, they experience administration, every different lecturer, um, different programs, the facilities and so forth, plus each other. From a lecturer's point of view, I have my module that I teach and, and that's it. And, and if you're lucky, you might know what the others are teaching or not. From the students' point of view, they're like, oh, we've been taught this three times now. Or um, I had a case when I was talking to our students about um, the application process and being accepted. And they said, why do you send us five letters when we've been accepted? And I went and spoke to the secretary uh, and they said, well, we only send one. And of course, every department says that. So. Involving those people and also the frontline people, so people who are working uh, either in call centers or sales or on the f receptions and so, so forth. Those people who are coming in contact with people all the time, getting the same questions over and over again, they have some massive expertise to offer. Um, and so that's a very good place to start and you can involve them in the process. At the same time, you can also involve other people from different departments in the process of designing something because they should be there early on. It's rather than having a set of an idea or a strategy decided upon from above, and then it gets delivered down and says, okay, now make that, make that happen, to a load of people who are then saying, that's not really going to work that way, or that, I've got some other ideas. Uh, that's, again, lost potential if, if you don't involve those people early on. And it's also a, a setting up a kind of fallout or argument later on when it comes to actually implementing it. So, uh, taking that as a, a perhaps a starting point, uh, we're talking about consumers and, and what they're doing, so the jobs that they're doing, but what uh, we often hear companies talking about product and service innovation. Yeah. Do you think they've got it in that sense? Do you think they've got, they're, they're focusing on the wrong thing? No, I mean, I think, um, I mean, it's good if they've got products and services in the same breath because often you hear about product innovation and often that's either a physical thing, uh, but none of those things exist in a, in a vacuum. Right? Even something like a bottle of water or a, a banana or something, you know, those, those are kind of discrete objects. They're actually part of a kind of ecosystem of, of it, depending on which level you look at. So it's my, my lunch today, or it's my, how I look after my, my body, or it's national kind of uh, health care and, and issues like that. So, Every object is always part of a, a larger ecosystem and it's very important to think of how does this fit into a, a, another part of a service. Um, so that, that sort of thinking is, is essential to start with, I think. Um, it, innovation has a tendency to be very kind of technology uh, driven. And of course it does deliver innovations too, but often it's about finding a need that's not been satisfied somewhere and, and, and satisfying it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be technology. I have many other questions that I'd really like to ask you at this point, but um, 
probably uh, needing to wrap it up. So I'm going to throw you one um, in relation to the university. If you had to apply uh, this design thinking or design process to a university, what do you think you would? Uh, <laughs> what do you think you would create? <coughs> I would probably. There's a politically correct answer to this, and there's the real answer. To be honest, I think the real answer is that um, other forms of education will, um, that are outside of the sort of established institution, will probably take over. And in Germany and Switzerland, where where education is near enough free and private institutions are slightly looked down upon, that's not it's not going to happen for a while. But in places like America and increasingly in Australia and and the UK, where students are paying for public education quite a lot anyway. A private institution that's not charging much more or charging the same but offering something very different is a real disruptor. I say that because I'd, I mean I'd love to see traditional institutions change a bit but if you look at what they how they're structured and I talked in my talk about this issue of silos you know that, that there's different silos have got their own little fife, uh, fiefdoms and they've got managers at the top and they've got um, there's sort of rigid structure and there's not much communication and you know this competition for budgets between the two and so forth that makes it very hard to create a kind of collaborative environment where you can fail um, and, and so forth and where you can think differently and you're in an institution that's uh, well, in some cases hundreds of years old and you know this is the way we've done things it moves very very slow um, and it's very hard for those institutions to react to what's going on in the world. And really, the, there's a, a, the educational model is 150 years old in terms of, you know, like I was saying before, that's a production line, industrial revolution. Whereas all of our students are probably going to have three, four, five or more careers in their lifetime, not to mention the numbers of jobs they'll have. So the idea that we can kind of teach a bunch of skills that's going to set someone up for the future and that's all they're ever going to need, it, is completely outmoded. You obviously need to teach people to be flexible and to think in, in, in flexible ways and collaborative ways. And institutions really, there's a lot of emphasis in research, for example, on interdisciplinary projects. And there's money sort of set up as a sort of a carrot saying, if you want some of this money, then at least two different departments have to work together on a project to, to do it. And I always think that's the wrong question or the wrong way of looking at it. I think the real question is to look at why isn't this stuff happening uh, spontaneously within our institution. What are the barriers to that happening? Let's take those away. Let's spend the money on taking those away rather than set up a kind of honeypot that tries to force people to work together. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm slightly pessimistic about academic institutions in, in that regard, that they'll really escape that kind of gravity that they're, they're in. Because it's also hooked into the uh, ministries and governments and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the uh, the MOOCs, the massive open online courses that could actually come in and shake that up. Do you, do you see that uh, perhaps influencing the way universities operate? Possibly. I, I've been involved, and for one of the reasons I went to Australia in uh, 99 was I was involved in an online project called the Virtual Design Studio called Omnium um, back in 97, 98. And something I've talked about for a long time is the, the ability for that to disrupt. I think at the moment um, it's not quite there. I see in America um, there's just been a, a Kickstarter project for a thing called the Unicorn Institute, which is a user experience institute there. Um, and it's been funded, it's been funded very well, and they're setting up something separate and outside. And they really started with this idea of if we were to start now with a blank slate, what would we do? And, and that's what they're doing. And I, I think that's likely to be where the disruptors are more than um, large online courses.